Mm -hmm. But with the 17th ATP to CLP coming into force in, is it mid-December? It's the 10th of December or something like that. It's a really weird day. Really weird day. It's not the first of a month or a last month. It's just... <laughs> um, we've got a, a double bind, as it were, coming up for people who are, um, for the substances rather, which are existing as mandatory classifications and are being made more hazardous under harmonised classifications under the 17th ATP. 17th of December. 17th of December. Is that the 17th because it's the 17th ATP? Um, I feel like I should certainly remember it better now. <laughs> oh, literally, that just occurred to me. Um, but anyway, the, so so what we we went, and this is like a self-help group question, but we're going to have to put it in tomorrow's newsletter because it's much bigger than just the self-help group. Mm. Um, the question was, if we have something that's in the 17th ATP that reduces its classification from the UK mandatory classification, what do we do? And the answer was, like we expected, wait until it goes through in the UK as well. Because... Mm because you never want to quickly reduce the classification of something just in case somebody's got it wrong somewhere you always want to wait for the law apply so yeah. we expected that from the hsc that's okay. a problem so we asked them again a question i asked them as soon pretty much as as brexit happened which is okay so what happens if we get this information in the atp in the eu that says for a hazard that's already on the MCL list, it gets worse. Surely under duty of care, we're supposed to pass that one. Mm. And they came back with the standard reply, which I have had ever since we had Brexit, that I am completely unhappy with. Well, there are three bits to it. Two of them I'm happy with, and the one bit is the one that really matters. If it's an end point that is a hazard class, that isn't listed on the mandatory classification list, you're good to go. Mm. You can use it voluntarily. It's extra information. If it's a substance that doesn't hold a mandatory classification, you're good to go because it's extra information. If it's one of these hazards that it's got an MCL hazard and the harmonized classification hazard increases, you've got to use the MCL lower hazard. Even though, exactly, even though you have got good quality evidence from the CLH process in the EU, because it's all published, that you agree with, legally, you are supposed to use the MCL classification until such time as it changes in the UK. Now, if the UK was running at the same rate as the EU, we wouldn't have this issue. Mm. but as it stands because of that discrepancy the legal advice from the HSE help desk is that you should use the MCL classification but that brings up what you might call a double bind for any company in that situation and like I say Trevor I don't think this covers you mm. you're okay but you yeah. still have to be aware of it yeah. if you are in a situation where new information on the hazards of a material comes to light under duty of care and the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, you are supposed to pass it on as soon as reasonably practicable. But under CLP in the UK, which comes under the Health and Safety at Work Act for enforcement, you are supposed to use the MCL. So you can be prosecuted under the Health and Safety at Work Act for keeping the MCL because you're not following duty of care, or you could be prosecuted for doing a more precautionary classification because you're not following MCL. You can be prosecuted under the same regular. And if you then put that more hazardous classification in your SDS, you could then be prosecuted under REACH as well. 
Right. And we as consultants could be prosecuted under each for giving you advice to effectively break the law mm. under reach because reach brings in consultants liability. So the fact that the HSE are slow in taking on board information on the most hazardous things means that they are placing certain companies in the UK in a legal double bind where they could, as the prosecuting authority as well, mind you, mm. they could basically go, who's using this stuff? Right. Okay, we're going to get them under this, so we're going to get them under that. And that is that is not right. We were not thrilled with that answer, were we, Janet? I think it's fair to say, Ali, that um, it's disappointing and frustrating that the HSC help desk and especially CLP policy people in HSC do not appear to recognise that it is placing industry in this double bind and that it is unfair of the regulator to be placing industry in this situation where whatever industry does, if they handle these specific substances, they are going to be out of compliance one way or another. Mm -hmm. Now, the way we handle it in-house in our own training in CLP Mastery is we basically have to say to people like you, to our lovely trainees, what do you want to be prosecuted for? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be prosecuted for not telling people about something that might harm them that we didn't know about? Or do you want to be prosecuted for a minor breach of the law? My own personal feeling as a business owner of some 21 years standing, I know, how the hell did that happen? Is that if I was in that position, what I would do is I would go with the more hazardous classification because it's not just whether the HSE prosecute you, it's whether somebody could be harmed by not passing that information on and you could be sued. And if you were sued, the chances are the HSE would then prosecute you anyway for not following duty of care. Mm. So I would, I would err on the side of being precautionary. Obviously, I would look up the information itself on the CLH and see if I agreed with it, because we don't always agree with the, the, the classifications that come out of the EU. Titanium dioxide, for example, but assuming it's good quality data, I would go with that. I wouldn't necessarily tell the HSE I was doing it. Mm. I'd prefer it if they would give us. That's what's so frustrating. I would prefer it if they would tell, yes, we know this is an awkward situation and this is what you do. Let us know that you're doing it and we'll, you know, we'll look kindly on you. We'll make sure our enforcement guys don't get involved or whatever. Um, because it's effectively a workaround until we get the MCL updates through. But we we are in limbo here. We're in legal limbo. On the 17th of December, some companies are going to be outside the law, regardless of what actions they take. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to flag this up to the HSC and to to the UK industry and to anybody selling into the UK, although technically it's the importers in the UK who are at risk over this, um, that this that this issue exists. And um, I've been trying well over a year and I don't seem to be making any headway. Mm -hmm. So all I can do is kind of warn people about it publicly. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem that grows. So the 17th ATP, obviously, in December, that's 39 substances that change. Um, but then next year, the 18th ATP, and that's November of next year, and that's another 17 substances that change. And every ATP, as we go forward, this will continue to happen um, and divergence um, will grow. Of the ones that are in the 17th ATP, what are the stats? How many of them are in this position that might take people outside the law? Um, so which one are you after, the 18th or the 17th? 17th ATP to see how many uh, existing hazards in the MCL are being increased in the EU. Increased in the EU, okay. That would be six. So it's not a massive number. 
but for those six substances under the 78 ATP for people handling them, that is a really big deal. And what about the 18th? Uh, it is a big deal, particularly when I point out that one of them is 1,4-dioxin. Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> which is on how many SDSs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and then the 18th, that is another... Um, one, two, three, four, five, another six. That... Another six. Are, is there anything that really stands out in the 18th as being specifically a problem? Ethyl hexanoic acid. <laughs> That's going to be a problem. I mean, and again, this is where the frustration comes in, because if the HSC prioritised the substances for bringing in on the into the UK MCL prioritised those ones where the hazard has increased and especially the ones that are commonly used then it would the, the situation would resolve overnight if they decide to to ad adopt the same MCL as as the EU's HCL mm. but at the moment we haven't had any UK MCLs published yet have we Ali no um butoxyethanol is on there as well that's not going to be pretty no, mm. that goes into a, is that in a lot of fragrances? Uh, yeah. Fragrances also shows up in um, metalworking. Mm. Yeah, it's a big so, one for industry. That yeah, so um, that means that means that there's a problem with. Sorry about that. That's my rinsing is um, flask out. Um, so we've got all sorts of noise today at this end. Um, the um, so that means that that we've got significant industrial chemicals that are going to place a lot of businesses at risk of being outside the law mm. because of the differences between the EU HCL list and the GB MCL list, and the problem has arisen because of the timescales for adoption in the UK, effectively, and. Mm. And that, it, it makes me, it makes me despair to a certain extent because the HSE should be more on top of this, I feel. I know it's very difficult. I know they've got Brexit and all the rest of it. But this is something that if you want to run a good chemical business that is compliant with legislation, that should make you uneasy. Because <clears throat> you literally, you cannot comply with that particular bit of legislation in the UK because you can't pass on the extra information. Mm -hmm. I see. So we are going to be putting information out on LinkedIn in the mm -hmm. newsletter to try and warn people as much as possible and get some buy-in from the rest of the industry to try and get this higher up the priority list for, yeah. for action being taken, I think. Yeah. If it's just making sure that there's some kind of workaround for this limbo period till everything sort of writes itself. But you're correct, Ali. As we go forward, we're always going to be, here's a new ATP from the EU, and there's going to be a lag period before any decisions made in the UK. Yeah, it's, it's a very new scenario for a lot of businesses. You know, a lot of businesses trade in multiple jurisdictions, <laughs> and they've come across this issue before of, do we apply data from one region to another? Um, so a lot of people, you know, they have the harmonized classifications from the EU and they look at, well, do we apply them in the US or do we apply them in Japan? Or that maybe they have the Japanese classification list and they say, well, do we apply this in, in the US? Or perhaps they look at the IARC monograph carcinogens and they say, well, it's not carcinogenic in Europe. So do we use it in this country or do we use it here? A lot of companies are making these decisions on a regular basis, but this is the first time uh, to my knowledge, it's the first time that a region has ever had, yes, you have this data, yes, you have this evidence, no, you can't use it. Um, and particularly when you consider that some of these companies will be the owners of this data because they will have carried out the testing that has resulted in the classification in the EU. So you are the holder of the data and yet you're being told not to apply the data. I, it's a very, very odd scenario. And and for myself, I feel that the 
Health and Safety at Work Act and the presumption of duty of care and passing that information on, that is the overriding moral imperative that we have, particularly in chemicals, particularly because of the damage that we know they can cause people. And to me, this failure of the HSE to actively acknowledge that there is a problem in the first place, there's been nothing published about this. It's all been on you know, discussions with the help desk and discussions with the policy people. But to, to not actively say, guys, we know there's a problem, but this is how we deal with it mm. in order to meet the moral imperative of duty of care. That is, it, in a way, it slightly, it, 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 it sort of sullies the previously good name of health and safety legislation in the UK. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and that, that, that upsets me. You know, that, make, that makes me feel a bit sad. Because the HSE are the people who are like almost the guardians, the conscience of industry. And they are the people who should be saying, you know, guys, we know you've got an issue and this is how we're going to, how we're going to do it. You know, I'm not, I'm not making a fuss about this because I want to rock the boat. No, I'm making a fuss about it because I don't want people to be placed outside the law through no fault of their own. And I, want, and I want the HSC to come and to provide the guidance and the leadership on this that they usually 95%, 99% of the time do to, to, to do that. Mm. Mm -hmm. ah. Okay, well, I think we've, we've rattled on more than enough about that. Yes. Um, but thank you very much for attending, Trevor. And no, everybody no. watching later on, really, really, a couple of really interesting topics. And uh, look forward to seeing everybody next month, hopefully. And um, take care of yourselves in the meantime. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.